الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين نستعينه ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن شرور اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد we suggest that one of the themes we could possibly benefit from talking about it today and studying it together inshallah in the sermon is preparing for the effectiveness of our work as a community when we have a heightened period of time of a blessed period of time like the month of ramadan coming up like everything else in life whatever we do we can have ambitions we can have the desire to continuously improve on what we are doing so we can present to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only the best of what we have and the best of who we are and settling in or accepting the status quo has not been one of the values of our tradition from generation to generation everyone who has had the responsibility or a sense of belonging to islamic work has done their best in order to take what they have learned stand on the shoulders of giants and make their own contribution so they can write a new page into our religion and thanks to that method our religion if you wish has remained a vibrant and living tradition that whoever takes custody of it feels a sense of responsibility that they should leave the, the world a little better than the way they started with it so it goes on from one place to the other clearly volunteering for islamic work should not be an exception one can only imagine that actually as a matter of fact that would be a perfect environment in which we model this type of striving for improvement so today to unpack this theme i have chosen from the quran and from the sunnah a number of pieces of advice if you wish to think about them that taken together could act as a playbook on how we enhance our collective work for our islamic work specifically needless to say that this learning could be applicable to other things but my primary focus today has been primarily for sacred islamic work it seems like the starting point for anything that has to do with investing oneself in islamic work is called the power of intention starting from a basis an idea that culminates in one's mind but then it moves us to action by formulating an intention so for example when it is time to stand up for prayers we make the intention to pray when it is time to prepare for our ablutions and purify before the prayers we make our intentions to make wudu our intentions to perform all of the major pillars because the intention is an integral part of the foundation that makes an act purposeful it, it it's like a a vector it takes a quantity and it gives it direction in order for us to do what we want to do and harness our resources in that intention and it is very well known amongst the entire community generation upon generation of the famous hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in which he said in the al-a'mal bin-niyad all of the acts of worship and the sacred forms of acts 
are predicated on their intention. Whichever intention you brought to the transaction will in fact uh, influence or define the reward and the outcome that comes from this. And what best in Islamic work than to be constantly reminded that the power of intention is to direct that intention for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, much like our creed is based on the idea of the shahada that begins with the negation followed by an affirmation. We begin by saying, la ilaha, so we negate any form of deity or mixing in our doctrine or misunderstanding of what it means to belong to monotheism. And then after we negate all of these things that are competing forces against the notion of an orientation of Tawheed, we then assert the monotheism in the form that Islam teaches us by saying, Illallah, except Allah. There are no other gods, no other deities worthy of worship or worthy of loyalty, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the Allah of the Ummah, the Allah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Allah of history, the Allah of the universe, it comes all from this. And I always think of the notion or the idea of intention almost as being the same notion of double movement. We remove the clutter, we remove all of the, all of the noises that are in our heads and in our minds and silence them to say that I am asserting, I am confirming, I am doubling down on bringing myself, my resources, my heart, my being, my commitment to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What, what a beautiful thing, like what an amazing idea. Truly, I mean, what an amazing idea. So a lot of people actually stand in line and, and quite frankly, some of them might pay a thousand dollar plate to just sit in an audience in order to benefit from a motivational speaker. What, what does a motivational speaker do? What, what is it that is the magic or the secret sauce of these people, if you wish, pedagogically speaking? They simply awaken what's inside us in order to help us connect back with that power of intention so we can have a purposeful life. I mean, that's what motivation is all about. Some people are saying, perhaps, it's very hard for me to get out of bed because I don't feel that my life has a purpose. And, and, and then we get lost in, in finding our way. And then in comes a voice of wisdom in our life and it shakes the grass and we feel like, uh, I needed that, I, I kind of needed to hear that so I can wake up and, and come to that thing. And, and that's the primary thing in any work that gives it purpose and direction. In going back to our teaching, the second building block of improving upon Islamic work that I found in the teaching of our tradition, subhanAllah, and this is invariable, it's quite interesting for every generation, for every ethnic group, for every slice of time you take. It doesn't matter where you slice the learning from Islamic history that gets passed to us. You find that what I'm gonna say is true across the board. Muslim teaching is always predicated on the idea of action, not the idea of accumulation of knowledge, but the idea of action. Success is not measured by how deep the vessel is, or how heavy the load on you is, it's always predicated on what did you do to learn however little you've learned to action. And that's an unbelievably also uh, empowering and liberating idea to be reminded of such an idea. In Surah Al-Saf, to make the point about this principle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in two verses back to back, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O ye who believe, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why is it that you say that which you do not do? Usually a rhetorical question of this nature coming from the creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not meant for entertainment. It's meant as a rebuke for people whose value system is not anchored into the idea that the knowledge that comes to us, 
that we take custody and responsibility for is a knowledge that is dead, that does not animate us in order to make us act upon that particular knowledge. Then the next of the verse, uh, kind of, for lack of a better term, focuses on the catastrophe or the calamity of those who are misaligned between being talking heads and preach a lot and do very little. So it says, Verily, it's not seen well uh, in the eyes of Allah. And that you in fact say that which you do not do. So what is being shown here is obviously the notion of misalignment, being sort of wishing for something and leaving it all to others to go and do it. So if I wish for something or uh, I'm the brainiac in the group or whatever the case is, but there are others, it's the responsibility of others to go and work it. Or the notion that could be highly personal, meaning that we spend a lifetime invested in pipe dreams, but none of them really culminate into the minimum of things, like moving a pebble from one place to the other in order to clear a path. That sort of, call it value system, is not looked upon favorably in our religion, there is a very strong emphasis in the notion of translating knowledge to action. In fact, more so than the general teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu has been in favor of accumulating less and doing more rather than the other way around. Accumulating less and doing more. Where did we learn this from? So at the time where he was the direct teacher of the community, he was the primary teacher of the community, he used to teach his companions, the Sahaba Ridwan no more than five verses at any one time. He could certainly have packed classrooms and go on for about five and 10 and 12 and 15 hours of monologues to the community. And I'm sure that there would have been recipients within that audience. But methodologically, as a pedagogy, that is not the model that the Prophet followed. He followed the model. Here are five verses and kind of go do something about them. There's a very, very cute uh, anecdote uh, which happened to Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, radiallahu ta'ala anha. As a scholar and teacher of hadith, one day, a student of his came and asked him for a letter of recommendation. It was very common within the Muslim tradition that you learn from one teacher. And if you want to go and seek knowledge to complement your knowledge from somebody else, you ask for a reference from your primary teacher. So he went to Ahmed ibn Hanbal and he asked him for a letter of reference. And so Ahmed obliged. So he wrote the letter of reference. And he said to the teacher that was going to be finishing the education or enhancing the education of the student, I'm sending you some, somebody, Yaktubun Hadith. I'm sending you someone who's a student who writes the Hadith. You know, all of us students, when we go to one of our professors and we ask for letters of recommendations, apparently it has always happened since that time. We try to kind of look over their shoulders to see what is it that they're going to write about us. So the student did. He looked over the shoulder of Ahmed ibn Hanbal in order to see what he wrote. And he was intrigued by the choice of words. He says, uh, shouldn't you have opted for a different choice of words instead of saying to the other teacher, I'm sending you somebody who writes the hadith, you should have said, I'm sending you somebody min ashab al hadith of the people of hadith. No, 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 no. Ahmed ibn Hanbal responded, ashab al hadith indana the people who qualify to become members of Ashab al-Hadith are the ones who live it. <laughs> Not the ones who go to accumulate it, are the ones who live it. That's kind of, you see, the point here is that the Quran that I just described it now in Surah Al-Saf is not an insulated, isolated idea. In fact, it found life in people modeling their behavior in every one of their lives. Does this make sense? So that, that's basically the idea that we learn from here. Perhaps another thought and another idea we could share is the notion in Islamic work when we try to work together is to remember as human beings, 
what we are at the end of the day, we are extremely good at, uh, at identifying patterns and leveraging them so we can learn from them. There is part of our learning that we cannot take any credit on, and that is essentially our biology, what gets passed down to me in my genes. And I happen to have some part of my reptilian brain that is completely coded for either taking flight or standing a position. I, I can take any credit in that. The biology has passed down this to me, and I have it as just an acquired reality that acts in fact, more often than not, despite my will of what to do with it. However, when it comes to the nurture part, when it comes to the nurturing of human beings, it's very important that we have mental models and reference frames and examples so we can borrow from these. And it's a form of accumulated knowledge that allows us to go much faster by learning because we can internalize and we can model after it. So this is why the Prophet if you wish, in his job description was a prophet and a messenger and a teacher and a husband and, a, uh, and essentially a, a father and, uh, and a commander in chief and, and a president of a state and, and the chief legislator and, and all kinds of things that he has done in his life. And a number of these in their job description in their forum one of them that he had, he was also the teacher, the teacher of the community. So you go to him so you can learn from him and you can model your life after him. And this is what people have done. This is why we have something called the path, the sunnah. So we go after that sunnah and what we understand it in our Muslim tradition, and which is something that seems to be missing from many other religious experiences, is the notion that we spent in inordinate amount of time and energy in codifying it such that it can be passed on, codifying it and preserving it with its integrity, so it can be passed on from one generation to the other, and so we pass on really goods that others can learn from as a model. And that is exactly what the Prophet said in his own language. He said in a famous hadith, Taraktu fikum amrain, I left amongst you or I left in your custody or in your trust. I left in your trust, O people, two things. If you hold on to these two things, the Prophet is making a guarantee. I guarantee that you will not lose your path. So what are these two things that the Prophet ﷺ left that he is guaranteeing that if we hold on to them, that we are not likely to go astray? Kitab Allah wa sunnatu rasuli. Verily, it is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is the, 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 the sunnah that he has left behind that serves as tradition. I am noticing that this, this particular point, this reality, that when we come to Islamic work, and especially now, Obviously, there is no question, no question about the fact that in the social sciences and in the management sciences, the world of 1500 years ago is very different from the world of today. In management science, we learn on how to optimize resource use to get the best efficiency out of the resources that we deploy. We optimize on how we organize our activities in order to get something that creates a win-win and provides us with the best outcome of the things that have been entrusted to us. These are not things that were readily available to people before. You either had to be a genius and stumble upon them yourself, or else it was a very long learning period with like a catastrophic learning cycle. If you need to understand about what the modern corporation here is today in the United States to look at a giant like an HP or, or a Facebook or a Google or an IBM. Turn the clock back and go read about the rare barons or the people who built the, uh, the oil wells at the beginning when just they struck gold with wealth and whatnot. And you will understand the unbelievable inefficiencies and catastrophes that existed in that generation before we learned from it, so we can get better optimized at other generations that came after them. And so that's the same notion, the same idea. So the principle of the Prophet stands 
but the methods by which we go from one generation to the other, we can do. So for example, as we organize Islamic work, I don't know, we're gonna start volunteering perhaps with God's help, inshallah ta'ala, the places of worship will open up and there are people who organize the dinner and people who organize the halaqa and people who organize the taraweeh and people who organize lectures and things like that. All of these things we can learn from, we can borrow from these mental models, we can bring them together and we can constantly improve them. It will be a little silly today to try to kind of send a message to the entire community by asking somebody to walk to the various neighbors, right? So you use modern communication paradigms in order to be effective on how you disseminate knowledge and how you syndicate knowledge and work with that. And that's the principle that we are talking about here. The next principle, and inshallah, there are only three, and with them we will conclude the khutbah. The next principle, very quickly, that we need to build on is really in Islamic work, we need a sense of accommodating others. We have, we have a little bit, I'm sorry to say it this way, and, and, and I don't mean it, with it in any way, form, or shape, disrespect or, or talking out of turn. More often than not, in our Islamic work, we have too many chiefs and not enough Indians. So, so the situation develops into a scenario where, where the number of ideas are amazing and flourish and come out to the front and whatnot. But then when people turn around and said, well, we kind of need help with this. How do we translate these or some of these into some reality? We kind of stall a little bit and it becomes a problem. And the idea is to really start to think about Islamic work in a principle that I call inclusiveness is to be very inclusive in anything we do together. So whoever wants to volunteer, we should be able to find room for them to volunteer in what they do. Wherever somebody has a particular type of talent, we should be able to make use of that talent with the task that is aligned to them. Wherever things need to be done of this nature, steps of common sense should work naturally. And that's one of the amazing things that the Prophet ﷺ did. I sometimes think of it sort of in terms of these paradigms. You look at the Sahaba around him, never, ever, any one of them carried the titles that I'm going to bestow on them right now by role, by job description. I'm not talking about somebody who has gone through the British Royal Court and ended up with one of the nobility titles, an Earl or a Duke. That's not, that's not what I'm describing at all. But you see the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ, the wahi is a better term, of the Prophet ﷺ in doing that with his Sahaba. It was very clear that when he came to Umar anhu, he was basically the equivalent of the uh, chief leadership officer, somebody who understood leadership, who modeled leadership, who acted upon leadership, and he was sort of the, the intellectual power into the groupings of the early Sahabas. Was very, very well known amongst Umar during his Khilafah, during his tenure, his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, used to report that there was never a time when Omar was an orator talking to a larger audience where after he would quote from the hadith and from the sunnah and from the authoritative sources that are sacred, that he wouldn't quote from poetry because he was a literary man, a red man. And he was very well, well read in his tradition and understood it. And that was the case across the entire generation that this was available. So that's one skill. The skill of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was the chief banking officer of the Prophet sallallahu So every time that you needed resources to be brought in and they were financial resources, you would go to him, etc. So you can see the logic on how the Prophet sallallahu yes, we are all human beings, we are all equal opportunity access to Islamic work, but there is wisdom in mapping the best skills to the best task at hand so we can all benefit and a rising tide can raise all boats. And that's a good idea. That's an Islamic principle in our tradition. And inshallah, we will conclude with the two last items with which we close. The next one, I think, which is very important, when you have Islamic work all put together, at this point today in the world, we need to direct it such that all of the resources that are pulled together are trying to put all of, if you wish, the wood behind the same arrow in order to deliver a larger impact in an area. This is very, very common today in management science and in other fields 
which of the two would you rather have? Would you rather make very, very small bets on too many things in case that one of them happens to work? Or would you rather uh, swing for the fences for something that is very large where the benefit that you can create could be gigantic for the community? And there seem to be more and more appetite towards the latter. I mean, it would have been catastrophic if we had this great leader in Islamic history whose name is Tariq ibn Ziyad, and he saw his mission of taking Dawah to Europe when he stood on the shores of the Mediterranean to cross the Gibraltar Strait, who would have kind of put his toes into the water and said, wow, they'd love to make it to the other shore, but boy, it's tough. You know what, boys, let's just pack and go home. It took sort of a fire inside the person to say, I'm going to cross this, and I have an obligation to do something for this religion. And then when he arrived to the other end, he said, by the way, tough luck, Tim, I just scuttled all of the ships, and there is no way back home. We're going to make it work here. And so there's sort of this, uh, this attitude of being invested for, if you wish, when you plan and you commit yourself to success, and you have this notion that we are all trying to do something to get to success, is extremely, extremely, extremely important. The question is, can we do this without breaking the glass? I'm gonna repeat this because that's a very, very important idea. There are many leaders out there and it's their hallmark on how they do their leadership. They can get everybody from a point A to a point B, but they will be leave behind like a casualty trail that you can see it from a mile because everybody else suffered during the journey in what it is. That's not the Prophet The model of the Dawah, and this is an unbelievable thing, for example, as the major difference, say, between the dynamics in politics and dynamics in Dawah. The purpose of dynamics in Dawah is that you are constantly trying to not be competitive, you are trying to be collaborative. And dynamics in politics is meant to be a competitive sport. You present a program, somebody else presents a program, people are going to vote, they might like this, they might not like that, and the way they vote with either their pocketbooks or their, their minds, they will choose one over the other. But for that one, you kind of keep going at it and at it and at it and at it again in the hope that you do something that sometimes looks even overreaching. It's a very, very, very famous story about the Prophet Sallallahu in one of the people who probably in the Medinian period, not the Meccan period, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in the Meccan period, there were a lot of people who were giving him tremendous hardship. But in the Medinian period, there were people who were equally of that type. So Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul is the very famous uh, Munafiq uh, hypocrite who just, you can say, that he invested his lifetime for one purpose and one purpose only, is to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fail. And the Prophet Sallallahu on the day of uh, sort of struggling with what, what to do with him, apparently there was a rumor that came out and the Prophet Sallallahu was not behind it. That the Prophet Sallallahu wanted him gone. The son of Abdullah ibn Ubayn bin Salul, who's the hypocrite, became a Muslim and came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he says, in our tradition, as you know, it's not a good idea to have the blood of someone be honored by somebody else because then people are going to be asking for retribution and revenge, etc. He says, let me eliminate my father if that is your wish. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, no, that's not my wish. That's not my wish. That's not the intent. Then Abdullah ibn Ubayd Salud dies naturally and the ayah comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that says, it doesn't matter how many times you ask forgiveness for this person, and even if you were to ask forgiveness 70 times, Allah will not forgive him. There's a very, very interesting reference to this ayah in the Sunnah in which the Prophet ﷺ said something after it. He said, uh, I wish I would have asked for forgiveness for Abdullah ibn Ubayd ibn Salul 73 times or more than 70 times in the hope that my acceptance will come. And this is radical commitment to empathy, radical commitment to inclusion. But I'm, I'm invested in the welfare of everyone. And it is on that note that I invite us, inshallah, that whenever we design Islamic work together, 
Think of these two lasting comments of the khutbah, inclusiveness and empathy. Make every Muslim that participates into volunteer work of a Muslim project feel worth it, feel respected, feel, feel included, feel part of something that is bigger than themselves. And I can guarantee you, you will see miracles in terms of the people who will have a long line trying to join your project. الحمد لله الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سلم كثيرا ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم واجعلنا منهم واخذر من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعل منهم We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whoever in our community is suffering an ailment that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring healing to them and to their families. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to push away this pandemic from us and bring our regular lives to our routine and our environment, inshallah, safely. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whoever is uh, going through difficulty or in hardship in their life because of the conditions that have changed that Allah will provide them with ease, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whoever is unjustly being uh, put under whatever conditions that are difficult that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the faraj and will bring the release inshallah and relief very soon in their lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our children back to this beautiful religion and above all we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve our life until we get the chance to inshallah begin the month of Ramadan that is coming imminently. الله أكبر الله أكبر